Great. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Brian Carey, and I'm pretty new here. So I am the up I, I work for Red Hat, and I'm the upstream Kubert CI maintainer. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about how we build Kubert CI with CentOS Stream. Um, so just for some background for anybody that doesn't know, uh, what is Kubert? Uh, Kubert is a, a virtual machine management add-on for Kubernetes. Um, it allows users to create, run, manage VMs in Kubernetes clusters. Um, it's considered a production-grade hypervisor, um, and as far as I know, it is the leading virtualization uh, add-on for Kubernetes. So it's the leading way to run VMs in Kubernetes. Um, last month, we had a very big milestone in that we that Kubert finally reached uh, version 1.0. So that was a, a big release for us. Um, testing a project like Kubert uh, comes with its challenges as it integrates a large number of different projects and sub-projects. Um, but in Kubert, Kubert proper, our testing can be broken down into two main categories, which is unit tests and our larger E2E -E tests, so our end-to-end -end tests. Um, the end-to-end -end tests actually require running against valid virtual uh, test clusters that we spin up. Um, one of the other aims in the project is that we try to stay as close as possible to the methodology used in the upstream Kubernetes uh, projects, so their testing methodologies upstream. Um, this means that we end up using a, their kind of ecosystem of tools, like services like Prow, um, which is basically like a, a Jenkins for orchestrating CI jobs against Kubernetes clusters. Um, so I can hear you thinking, okay, that all sounds great, but where does CentOS Stream come in? So CentOS Stream is the solid base that we use for our virtual test clusters, which are then scheduled to larger workloads clusters. So these clusters are spun up uh, for our end-to-end -end testing. Um, the test cluster node images, there's a specific project that we have, a sub-project within the Kubert organization called Kubert CI, and this project is responsible just for building these cluster providers, as we call them. Um, the, overall, these, these cluster providers, the, the virtual ones, are based off of uh, CentOS Stream Vagrant images. So we basically take the latest CentOS Stream Vagrant image continually as, as much as we can. Um, so the building process, all of this is done through automation, but the, the general guideline for it is we basically have a Fedora container spin up. This Fedora container has all the tooling required to start up the CentOS Stream Vagrant image. And then we have a tool for orchestrating the provisioning of these images. We call this tool, it's written in Go, so it's called Go CLI. This tool basically just orchestrates which scripts are run where, as some scripts are run during provisioning, and some scripts are run at cluster runtime, basically. Um, the, once the provisioning scripts mainly focus on setting up network and storage requirements, any dependencies that we have for installing Kubernetes with QBADM. Um, so these scripts are all run against the VM at provisioning time. Um, once these scripts complete successfully, the VM inside the container is then shut down, um, and we then commit that container image as an image, as a, as a container image. So that image is then committed with the updated VM image inside. Um, so, okay, that's great. We have a node image, but how do we know if what we built is actually a valid Kubernetes cluster? So within the Kubert CI repo, we have a number of test lanes that run against these new, any changes that are pushed into the Kubert CI repo as pull requests. So these run a, a subset of the Kubert end-to-end -end tests, and it, they also run the, cube, the suite of Kubernetes conformance tests so that we know what we're building is an actual valid Kubernetes cluster based on CentOS stream. Um, any merge changes to this Kubert CI repo leads to new uh, cluster provider images being published to Quay. Um, so they're always available there. The, uh, when our automation picks up that there's a new image in Quay, this, this image is then picked up and a PR is created against Kubert Kubert proper so that we can run the full suite of end-to-end -end tests against this image as well. So we do have some protections there against running against the latest CentOS stream. Um, but we rarely hit any issues. Um, so this is kind of a picture I drew up. Part of the reason why I wanted to do this talk was to spend some time drawing this up from my own mind. Um, so this is how it looks when it all comes together. So these end-to-end -end test pods, um, they're basically scheduled to our worker nodes. Um, the, the, the ones here below just reflect the top one. It's the same thing throughout. 
Um, generally, our, so basically within the end to end test pod, we have a podman instance which spins up our node container image that we've just published. And then this node container image in turn starts up the CentOS stream VM. And then the Kubernetes cluster gets to a running and healthy state following some runtime scripts. And then we basically install Qvert against it and we run our test suite, which basically Qvert uses this, this vert launcher pod concept for spinning up VMs with inside these vert launcher pods. Um, so basically those test VMs that we spin up inside that test suite are running in nested virtualization. Um, the bare metal nodes up until recently were also running CentOS stream as well in production. Uh, some, of the, some of the benefits we saw from using CentOS stream, um, first of all, it's an extremely stable base. So 99.9% .9 of the time, we don't hit any issues. So it's just smooth sailing 99% of the time. Um, it allows us to catch any potential issues earlier than we would have previously using the old CentOS 8 model. Um, so previously, the providers were built with CentOS 8. Um, but we've moved to stream, we've moved to stream 8 and stream 9. Um, over the last year, we've hit a couple of issues, really only a handful of issues. A couple of examples here. So we hit a couple of kernel bugs. Uh, we hit an issue with Network Manager uh, and some DHCP clients. And then SE Linux policy changes can trip us up every so often that our components in Qvert that basically require certain privileges and CentOS stream can't be aware of that. So then we have to talk to, between projects to see what is the best way forward in that way. Sometimes we have to make changes on our end. Sometimes CentOS stream makes changes. Um, so overall, CentOS stream is a very good target for us for testing as it really reflects our main downstream product, which it will be uh, OpenShift container native virtualization. So it's very good at reflecting that environment and it also allows us to catch issues very early. Um, so problems we've hit, I, re I really struggled to come up with any major problems here. Um, I had it on my overview for the, for the talk, so I said I better include it. Um, so issues are very rare, as I said on the previous slide. Um, sometimes we get blocked with CentOS stream issues. Well, they're not CentOS stream issues, but issues that we hit. Um, and that blocks us from delivering new providers. So if a new version of Kubernetes comes out, sometimes we can be blocked from testing against the newest version of Kubernetes because we have some issue back here in CentOS stream. Um, the second point is just a, a pet peeve of mine. Because we're always testing against latest, uh, basically, we have the latest kernel in CentOS stream, and then we're running our automation, and the automation fails because the kernel modules aren't there yet. So that's just that's the one we hit every so often. Um, then I have community members coming to me and going, why are these lanes failing? And I'm like, I just give it a 20 minutes and they'll be there. But um, so this always starts up the conversation within the Qver community, whether we want to pin to a certain version of CentOS stream or not. Um, in my opinion, we get way too much value from running against the latest in order to pin it, and we do not want to be managing uplifts of CentOS stream because we will fall behind. So I generally just prefer just to go to latest. Sometimes we'll pin an individual package for a certain period of time just to get around a problem, but that's always a temporary measure. Um, running off the latest just gives us too much benefits. Um, so yeah, as a, as a bonus content slide, I said I'd um, show you where to get CentOS stream VM images for Qvert. So if you want to ever, if you have a Kubernetes cluster and you have Qvert installed somehow, uh, and you want to run a CentOS stream VM, we have um, container disk images that we build and publish um, in Quay as well. So these container disk images are used for ephemeral VMs normally. They're um, very handy for CI or any kind of testing that you might be doing. Um, they're basically based off of the CentOS stream cloud images, so they're loosely wrapped around those. So basically any of your configuration will be cloud init config that you would need for that. Um, yeah, and the image registry also includes a handy YAML example to get a, a stream VM up and running very quickly. I was going to attempt to do a, a demo on it, but I, I, I chickened out towards the end. Um, so yeah, here's just a screenshot of the landing page as a result. Um, as you can see, the, the, uh, the YAML is quite, quite brief. Um, it's probably a bit small on the screen there. But you have your cloud init config down here, and you just add your cloud init config, and then you can do whatever you want. That, that basic example will get something running, but it won't be much use to you. You won't be able to sign into it. You won't be able to get into the VM or anything like that. So you add your SSH keys, your authorized keys, or whatever to that cloud init config. Um, so yeah, just to conclude, um, Qvert loves CentOS stream, really. Uh, it's not just, as I alluded to previously, it's not just using Qvert CI. It's 
used all over Qbert. So all of our Qbert artifacts are built in a CentOS stream workspace. Um, Qbert actually relies on the CentOS stream virtualization stack. So we actually take libvirt and Qemu from, from the CentOS stream nine repos, and we actually use those and build those into our virt launcher pods that I mentioned earlier. So they're actually the, the components that are actually starting up the VMs in the Kubernetes cluster. So that's all stream nine uh, virtualization stack. And our production CI workloads cluster was deployed on CentOS Stream to very recently. And, uh, unfortunately, the burden of maintaining OS updates and Kubernetes updates on that cluster was too much, so we moved to OpenShift just recently. The updates were, were on me to do, so <laughs> it was too much. Um, yeah, so then just to finish up, just to say thank you to the CentOS community, and if there's any questions. I'm curious a little bit about the Vagrant layer. Uh, was that a traditional decision, or is that something it's, that you chose? It, yeah, it was a long-term decision. It was a long a decision made a long time ago, and it's been carried forward. Um, the, the Vagrant image gives us kind of a handy user setup and login details into the Vagrant image, and we just use those then throughout our automation. So to change it, it would involve a bit. Um, but the Vagrant images have been working pr quite well for us. So. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to hear from Vagrant users for sure. So. This might be a basic question. I, I missed the beginning, unfortunately, because I was between rooms. But um, can you explain to me, like, what's the elevator pitch for KubeVirt? Like, it's, it's you're virtualizing inside virtualization? Uh, no, no, no. So the Qvert product itself will be, um, that's, that's only Qvert CI, so that's only how we're running our E2E, our end-to-end -end tests. So that, that nested virtualization only happens within our test suites. Um, but Qvert itself, if for any, anybody that has large Kubernetes clusters that they want to run VMs alongside pods, um, for large organizations who might be migrating to a, a Kubernetes workflow and they have existing VMs, they can easily just take that image and deploy it straight onto their Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster. Um, and then they basically, it, it, it helps the transition to that Kubernetes kind of way of working. So the VMs are basically treated as a container, well, not, uh, not the word container, but a place that apps go. It's not that the containers are running on top of that VM. You could, you could run, you could, you could go all the way down, but uh, no, generally the, the VMs would be, uh, yeah, just running inside pods, and they'd be more or less, they'd be kind of like monolithic services that would be running there. Okay, okay, and then the other question that I had was, when you're doing nested virtualization in your CI, yeah, is the environmental difference when you're doing that, is that limited in terms of you don't find certain things because it's not quite the same environment? Uh, not really. There, there is a performance impact. So there's a slight performance impact. So our, when we run our, our test suite on, on bare metal, it runs a lot faster. But the nested virtualization, there's a small performance impact there. So some of the tests may have may take longer. So we do have kind of we have a, a flaky test process that we have to try and identify these tests and make sure that they're they're kind of fixed to to fix those kind of flakes. And then is it running on OpenQA in Fedora? No, no, okay. no. This is this is all running on. Uh, a big, large, bare metal workloads cluster that we have. Okay, thanks. <laughs>